I'm Kathy High, and along with my colleague, arts professor Branda Miller, um, who's here with us today as well, we co-program the arts department series, IER Presents. These bioart talks are also sponsored by RPI's Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies, or CBIS, the arts department, the School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, and finally, the Sanctuary for Independent Media's Nature Lab initiative. So we thank all our co-sponsors. I'd like to begin today with a land acknowledgement. Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute resides upon the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are indigenous peoples of the lands of New York. Despite tremendous hardships and being forced from their lands, today, their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We honor this community past and present and are committed to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So um, these bioart talks at CBIS are a series of online presentations given by internationally recognized bioartists and Bioartists, bioart can be defined in a, a hundred different ways, but um, for the most part, I consider it artists who are working with biological materials and use biotechnology to possibly to produce their artwork. Um, looking at the materiality of biosystems and the processes used in biotech or science research or both. So I'm a, I'm a practicing bioartist and thus my interest in this. And I'm really happy to have all of these artists we've had um, included in this series, which started with Orkan Telhan, then Heidi Boisvert, then Aysen Caro Kachin, and Anna Lindemann, and today's very special guest, Mary Magic. Woo Mary. Um, funding for this series has, um, been gener we've been generously supported by funds from the New York State Council on the Arts and by approval of the New York State Legislature and the governor. So we're really grateful for this support. Couldn't do it without it. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Mary. Mary Magic is a binary artist working at the intersection of hormones, body and gender politics and ecological alienations. Magic refers uh, frequently uses biohacking as a xenofeminist practice of care that potentially demystifies invisible lines of molecular biopower. Completing their master's in the design fiction group at MIT Media Lab, they also have received the Pre's Ars Electronica honorable mention in the hybrid arts area in 2017 for the project Open Source Estrogen. And also, Magic received a 10 month uh, Fulbright Research Award in Yogyakarta, you have to help me with that, Mary, Indonesia in 2019. Magic is a current member of the global network Hacteria, open source biological art, the tactical theater collective Aliens in Green, the Asian Feminist Association Mailing Vienna as well as a contributor to the Radical Syllabus Project Private Care and to the Online Cyber Feminist Index. We'd love to hear about all of these associations after the talk. I also, I'm just so delighted to have Mary here today because we've known each other since Mary very generously helped me put up a show at UCLA back in 2015. And her work is just keeps getting better and better and better. Um, and so I'm super stoked about this talk and that you all get to hear her talk and, and meet her too. Um, the talk's title is We're All Living in the Estro World. And this talk asks, how do bodies queer at the molecular level? How is this queering inextricably tied to industrial capitalism? Combining body and gender politics and environmental toxicity, we begin to unpack the concepts of open source estrogen, the underlying premise that uh, hormonal molecules are ubiquitously all around us, available for us to hack, mutate, and become with. So there's some incredibly rich ideas. Um, already you can you can sense them from this description. And so let's please welcome Mary 
and we very much look forward to your talk. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for the introduction, Kathy. Um, I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer because um, my internet might go spotty. Um, so if that happens, just let me know and I can just move closer to the router. Um, yeah, so I'm actually um, broadcasting from Vienna in Austria. So I'm around six hours ahead of you. Um, and uh, I'm originally from Los Angeles, but now I'm based in Vienna where um, I'm raising a little one that's four years old, my little daughter, and, uh, and also um, doing art uh, as my second career besides my first career as a, as a mother. But now I'm just going to share my screen since we just have, um, I guess, 30 minutes, 30 or 40 minutes because I want to leave some uh, time for questions. Okay. You can take as long as you want, Mary. It's okay. <laughs> cool. All right. All right, so as previously mentioned, the title of my talk is We Are All Living in an Extra World. So in this talk, I kind of want to unpack what I mean by the astral world, because I'm not only talking about the alienations that arise from these molecules, these residues of, of um, industrial capitalism that is responsible for alienating our bodies and environments, but I'm, I want to talk about a kind of double-sided alienation where the second part of that really comes from these heteronormative and patriarchal structures that we've been born into. So there's that kind of double alienation going on. And so that's why I felt like I needed a term to kind of encapsulate um, this phenomenon. So that's why I came up with the word estro world. So I'm gonna unpack what that means now. So I like to start my presentation with this quote by Ian Hacking, a Canadian philosopher uh, from his book from 1983, Representing and Intervening. We did not find sex hormones somewhere in a lost corner, like a desert island lost in the mist. We ourselves called sex hormones into existence. So back in 2015, when I first started researching on open source estrogen as part of my master's thesis at MIT Media Lab, uh, one of the first things I did was I just did a Google image search of the word estrogen. And this is a screenshot back in 2015 um, of all the images that I got from the Google image search. And as you can see, there are lots of images that code for femininity, like larger breast size and smoother skin. Um, and um, there's also lots of products that are sold by the pharmaceutical industry. So there's like hormone replacement therapy, there's birth control. So um, I felt like, you know, from this collection of images, it really gave me a summary of what our relationship with hormones are, that it's based primarily on this pharmaceutical industry. Um, I was also really interested in how gender became this black box fact that estrogen produces femininity and testosterone produces masculinity. And as a biohacker, um, I was interested in not just hacking the physical molecules, but also hacking their meaning, right? Their symbolic representations. So how did we arrive at this black box fact, right? And as my research carried on further and further, I got interested in how there are so many molecules already in the environment that are hormone mimicking and hormone displacing. So I'm just gonna call these terms, um, these these molecules, endocrine disrupting compounds, or, um, or sometimes I just refer to them as toxicities. So uh, the kind of three main culprits responsible for all of these um, industrial residues uh, would be the petrochemical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and the agricultural industry. So um, I'm not gonna go into the kind of history of these industries, but it's really interesting how, um, 
they have such a clear um, separation now, like we, we distinguish these industries as separate, but back then, like back in the early 1900s, um, they were much more entangled. Um, for example, BPA, um, it, it was actually used in a lot of medical studies as a possible estrogenic molecule. Um, scientists actually studied BPA as a possible um, medicine or drug to prescribe to women or, and market to women. Um, and they found more potent molecules. So then they just kind of forgot about BPA until the, the petrochemical industry took on BPA and started using it as a plasticizer. So this was back in the 1930s. So arguably, um, we, our bodies have been querying under the effects of BPA since the 1930s, or we've known them, known them to, be ha to have querying effects since the 1930s. So why is all this happening? Why are all of these, these residues of industrial capitalism communicating to our bodies and querying our bodies and transfecting change? So um, it, the, the green molecule um, in this image, this represents the estrogen receptor. And scientists have called this receptor highly promiscuous, which is kind of a strange term to describe a molecule. But what they mean is that if, if the receptor is a lock, then that means it has many keys that fit inside of it. So that's why, you know, not only are natural estrogens bind to the estrogen receptor, but also the microplastics and the BPA and dioxins and, and PCBs and all of these other molecules also communicate to our estrogen receptors. Another really interesting thing about this receptor is that it is highly conserved. So what that means is if you think about the first organism, like the first ancient organism that evolved to have a vertebrae, and if you think about all the other species that evolved after that, so, you know, the animal kingdom and um, like all of these other kingdoms that evolved after this ancient organism, we all share the same estrogen receptor. So that's why you hear all these stories about frog and fish and even bird populations declining because they're unable to reproduce because they are um, exposed to these, um, to these chemicals, to these toxicities. So really we are undergoing this collective species mutagenesis. We have this shared species vulnerability. And um, I started to frame this, um, this pollution, permanently pollu permanent pollution toxicity phenomenon as, it, as a kind of molecular colonization. And uh, the reason why I use the word colonization is because I really believe that plastic pollution can be understood as something colonial. Um, there's something about plastic where it is, it's, it's actually designed to be a deliberately alienated material. And what I mean by that is that it's kind of designed to have this non-locality, right? As a result of globalization. It's like we, we don't really um, know or kind of, we don't really understand like where this came from, right? Where did this plastic come from? So it has this kind of non-locality and which is a form of colonial logic, right? This colonial logic of dislocation and disassociation. So, um, so when I use the word colonization, I, I also want us to think about, well, what does it mean to decolonize our bodies and our environments? Because when we think of decolonizing, I don't want to initially say like, oh, let's just clean up. Because I don't believe that to be, the, to be the only strategy available. Although it's, it's the mainstream strategy to just like, okay, we need to clean up this pollution and return nature back to its pristine order. I don't agree with this, or I'm, I'm quite critical of this because it's just reinforcing this, this idea of purity as if you know nature is like this untouched thing, but it's actually a human construct. 
So um, I want us to think about other strategies beyond just cleaning up and to come. And I want also our strategies to come from the starting point of just acknowledging that plastic is now nature. So um, the kind of beginning of this project um, started a lot with hormone hacking. So biohacking and hacking hormones. So um, I really love this term by Claire Pentecost, who is a writer and also an artist, uh, public amateurism. So I feel like my early practice in hormone hacking really aligns with the concept of public amateurism. And Claire describes it as the process of learning and doing and failing in the public sphere and kind of sharing knowledge without this hierarchy of the layperson and the expert. So um, I really love this way of working in a participatory and collective way because I think knowledge production or the process of knowledge production is inherently political because we're choosing to create knowledge outside of the institutional realm. And therefore we're creating new ways to, to describe this world, to, dis, to define and describe this world and this reality. So um, one of the first protocols that I was working with were these yeast biosensors. So these are actually transgenic yeasts that contain human estrogen receptor in them. So they're actually acting as extensions of our bodies. So the way that they act as biosensors is that when they come in contact with any kind of xenoestrogen or endocrine disrupting compound, they will turn yellow. So that lets me know that, that, that um, the stuff that I'm testing has xenoestrogens in it. And then after I figured out a really cool detection method with the biosensors, then I was interested in extraction. So this is a very simple kind of column chromatography method that is separating the hormones based off of their chemical properties, like their polarity. So um, Kathy has also been in this workshop before. Um, so basically I'm using everyday materials like silica gel and cigarette filters and methanol. Methanol is not so everyday, it's actually quite dangerous um, alcohol. But um, I'm using these um, very basic ingredients to filter out hormones from urine. And I really like doing this workshop because after we filter out the hormones, um, they're, they're actually acting as pheromones. So um, the brown sticky stuff at the bottom of that tube, those are the hormones that have been extracted from um, a collective urine sample. And we always do this smell test. And um, just as a fun fact, every person has a different collection of nose receptors. And so that's why everyone's nose and sense of smell is different. So um, we all take turns smelling the same sample and we actually all react differently which is really interesting. And I appropriated this protocol into a speculative fiction film called Housewives Making Drugs. So this is a 10 minute film that I shot with two trans actresses. And the idea is that it's a cooking show for trans women and, it's, and the stars of the show are trans women. Uh, teaching the audience at home how to extract hormones from their own urine and use it as a form of body sovereignty that is kind of in reaction to this institutional gatekeeping of trans medications. So um, it's a satire actually of uh, cooking shows like the Martha Stewart show and things like that. So there's a lot of humor in it and um, it, and it was a really fun project to make um, just to be able to culturalize these scientific protocols and bring them into more of a, a social cultural dialogue. And here's an image of my mobile labs because um, I was doing lots of workshops um, from city to city and I, I just wanted a way to, to pack all of my scientific equipment and 
I had these mobile labs I was traveling around with and some museums got in contact with me and they wanted to display my mobile labs as art objects. So I thought that was kind of funny um, because they had a very practical use for me, but uh, here they are as art objects. And here's some images of the kind of messiness that emerges from my workshops. And I really like showing this messiness because I see it as a very co-generative and emergent space, right? Because um, yeah, to some, to some degree, it is, it is a didactic workshop because I'm teaching people like exactly what to do. But then the mess that's generated is totally, I mean, it's, um, it just emerges on its own. And I really enjoy that because it's very much about the process. It's very much about establishing new relationships with hormones and uh, new knowledges about hormones. And every workshop I've done has been different because I do it in different cities with different participants. So um, it's, it's really great to just um, engage in this process of knowledge production. And lastly, I'll talk about um, the, these fungi that are able to break down toxicities. So um, they do this by having these enzymes that um, are responsible for breaking down organic compounds like cellulose and lignin. So most often you will find these fungi growing on trees that are dying or already dead. So um, if you look at a lot of plastic polymers, they also exist in these chains that are broken down by the, by the same enzymes. So I find this very interesting because there's this co-evolutionary process happening between the organic and the synthetic. And I, as part of a collaborative residency that I did in 2017, um, we decided to appropriate a scientific paper that was describing a decolorization process for working with these mushrooms. So um, we grow the mushrooms on agar that is stained blue. And this blue color is derived from blue genes, which is actually a toxic um, compound. Um, so the mushrooms in response to this blue toxic compound, they start to decolorize the agar so you can see it's going from blue to kind of an orange peachy color. We decided to push this experiment further by actually creating a xenoestrogen cocktail that's been extracted from various different consumer products like uh, cleaning products, cosmetics, uh, some people even brought some birth control pills. And so we all just do these different kinds of extraction processes. A lot of it's like, like pseudoscientific because we're actually inventing new processes. Um, we didn't find any scientific papers that, um, that had like a clear protocol because every single product that we're working with is different. You know, we have creamy stuff. We have like alcoholic alcoholic stuff. And so we had to invent our own processes. And so we fed this cocktail to the mushrooms with the hypothesis that the decolorization would actually be sped up in the presence of these industrial molecules. And then I used these, I appropriated these uh, mushrooms in an installation I did in Jogja, in Jogjakarta, Indonesia as part of a 10 month Fulbright residency that I did in 2019, right before the pandemic. So I was really lucky to get there before Corona started. Um, so I, I applied for this Fulbright residency with the proposal River Gynecology. So the idea is how can we engage people who live along the river to care for the river as if it were their own bodies? Um, Jogjakarta is a city that I've been visiting since 2014. So um, I was already familiar with that environment and the kind of plastic pollution crisis that is um, all over the country, actually. And um, I was collaborating with a collective there called Life Patch, and they had already done a lot of river projects in the past, uh, particularly river mapping. So I 
I just kind of hopped on the river mapping project and I was talking a lot with local people living along the river. And what I found interesting was that um, their notion of the river or their relationship with the river was very much tied to Javanese mysticism. Javanese stemming from the island of Java, which is where Jokshikarta is located. So um, I found this really interesting because they did not see the river as an actual river, but they saw it as a highway that connects two spiritual kingdoms, one in the north and one in the south. And I even met shamans who had witnessed spirits crossing the river to get from the south to the north kingdom. So I found this really interesting um, as a form of cosmology and way of relating to this polluted landscape. And I collected a lot of trash from the river uh, and I animated it into this rotating mandala projection. Um, mandalas are a traditional Buddhist practice of creating order out of chaos. Um, but I view our bodies as inherently chaotic and very queer. So I decided to animate this mandala. And um, I wanted to show this, um, you know, this, the fact that, you know, matter, like plastic as matter is itself, is in itself fundamentally queer and always entangled with our bodies. So what's happening inside this mandala, I also view as happening inside of our bodies as like this constantly queering and glitching matter material. So um, as an artist, I'm, I'm really interested in our cultural dialogue and our cultural discourse around toxicities. So going, I'm going now into like the, the second alienation that I talked about in the very beginning. Um, so I came across this article that was published in 2016. It's a scientific paper. Um, they were they actually made a um, a hermaphrodite species of fish, and in the title of the paper, they called it a hopeful monster, which is a really interesting phrase to see in the scientific paper, and. Um, they called it hopeful because it's actually able to self-reproduce because it has both ovaries and testicles. So this got me thinking, well, why can't our bodies also be regarded as hopeful monsters? Because I come across a lot of these other articles um, that are really um, um, showing a different story. So for example, this is a blog post from um, some writer and basically what the blog post is saying is, well, I don't think that the government should be putting birth control pills in the water supply because it's making all the men gay and we need both men and women to propagate the human species. And we should talk about this rather than talking about foreigners crossing our borders. So I find this article to be very problematic because you have uh, homophobia, transphobia, and even xenophobia in the same article um, around the topic of toxicities. And um, of course, I, we should care about the environment. We should care about all of these um, reports of toxic leaking and toxic dumping that's happening and how it's affecting all of the human and non-human species. Um, but I think there's something really wrong when the empathy that we are showing um, is for only certain bodies and not others. So this kind of uneven empathy that's happening. Because, you know, we still have this medical practice today where if a child is born in the hospital with ambiguous genitalia, a doctor will actually perform a surgery to make the, the infant either a girl or a boy. And if you think about it, it's just, it's just based on these 
these numbers, these measurements, right? So in this diagram, it's saying, okay, so um, the clitoris should be between zero and one centimeters. And if it's between 2.5 and 4.5 centimeters, then it's a penis and anything in between requires surgery. You know, so these are just measurements, you know, these are just based on calculations of the body where we have, we have created these normative definitions, right? And from these normative definitions, there's this medically and socially accepted practice of policing bodies. So um, I was really interested in where that kind of fear and panic comes from when bodies are existing outside the norm. So I started this project called the Molecular Queering Agency. I started it in 2017 as a kind of urine worshiping disobedience ritual. So here we are, we're actually worshiping the urine as this evidence of our disobedient bodies. Because what you find in urine is actually both the organic and the synthetic hormones that we produce in our bodies and that we are exposed to respectively. So in 2021, so just last year, I was commissioned to kind of revamp this project and I turned it into a much larger participatory performance. And I also, um, I created these costumes that are, um, that are, they're based off of things that you can actually buy um, to be like anti-UV and like antibacterial. So it's kind of like, you know, these costumes are meant to, to kind of barricade you from the outside world. Um, and I, I decided to send out an open call to, you know, okay, we're looking for nine people to join this performance and you're gonna do some basic choreography. You're going to give me a sample of your urine. You're gonna put on this oxygen mask that contains hormones. And so these people answered the call and here we are performing together. I'm the first person in the line and everyone's just copying my choreography. And a lot of the choreography is actually inspired from kinesiology, which is a kind of therapeutic practice for releasing trauma from the body. Um, I got interested in kinesiology because I was thinking about how microplastics are stored in the body um, and how that's kind of linked to the trauma that's stored in our bodies. So um, I'm appropriating a lot of cult techniques so um, this idea that, you know, creating this collective and unique experience kind of bonds everyone into this like um, cult kind of sense of belonging. So um, there's definitely some of those elements in there. Um, but I, I really like working in this space of just unknowingness, you know, because uh, these are people that I've never met before and they've never met me and they have no idea what's going to happen in the performance and they're just trusting me with their bodies. And I think this kind of trust building exercise is, is part of um, the strategy of living in this, in this um, toxic world. So um, that's, the, that's the newest version of Molecular Queering Agency. Here's some close-ups. We also perform an extraction during the performance, um, which is funny because they don't know that they're doing something scientific. Like they have no idea that they're doing something that's, you know, column chromatography. Um, they just think that they're part of this weird culty performance. But we are, we are filtering out the hormones in this performance. And this is um, kind of like my kit, you know, like it's kind of like my, my kit that I always refer back to as an artist. Um, I call it my three-step process for living in an increasingly queer world. So um, I use this kind of outline for all of my workshops and performances and presentations, and I apply it to a lot of my projects. So step one, toxicities. You live in an alien landscape that is colonized by hormones. Step two, semiosis. You are already alien you have hormones and microplastics in your blood and in your urine. Step three, subjectivities. Do you want to be more alien than you already are? 
And step three is kind of like, it's, it's the, um, it's my goal in all of my, my workshops and performances, because I want us to, I want us to get to this point where we have neutralized the fear, we have neutralized the panic, and now we can start to collectively come up with new subjectivities and new ways of being with this world. So like I said before, like we need to start from that point of acknowledging that, that plastic is now nature. Like step one, toxicity is this, we, we already live in this alien landscape. So that's the starting point that I want us all to, to begin with. And now I wanna talk about this project that is actually on um, exhibition now. I'm actually in the exhibition space of this project called Genital Panic. So this is a queer feminist population study or it's trying to simulate a queer feminist population study by, um, by crowdsourcing 3D scan genitals into a database. And from this database, we can begin to to redefine genital aesthetics for the toxic era that we're living in. So, um, so it's, it's a project that's trying to archive our queer bodies. And I do this by setting up these um, performative clinics. So it's a gynecology office looking space where you are actually the doctor and no one else. And so, um, there's a software that people can operate on their own where they can sit in the chair and they can enter in their basic demographic data. Here's the software. And, and then they perform the genital scans and the genital scans go into this database. And um, the reason why I call this a, a queer feminist population study is because we are, um, we're trying to, to define bodies from the bottom up rather than the top down because traditional science and traditional scientific studies are inherently patriarchal and political. They are um, infused with all of this uh, gender bias already and um, especially biases around normative bodies, especially this, um, this anal genital distance, which I'm going to abbreviate as AGD. So the AGD has, um, I see it as a tool of patriarchal science because uh, scientists actually measure the AGD of human and non-human bodies in order to assess reproductive toxicity. Um, male bodies have, um, they, they should have twice the distance of female bodies. So this is like the accepted kind of rule, not just for human bodies, but also for, for mice. Like I, I met this scientist who was actually gendering mice by looking at the genitals and the distance between the anus and the genitals. So, um, but then because of all of these toxicities that we're living with, um, the body is actually changing, right? Like, like male bodies are actually exhibiting the same length as female bodies. So for me, it's like, how do, you, how do you archive something that's always changing in response to the environment? Um, I'm also really curious um, about the kind of like part two of this project, which is you know, where we start to redefine genital aesthetics because then we're kind of performing that process of creating categories, right? And categories have this inherent process of othering which can be a violent process, right? When we think about all those bodies that are excluded and not really fitting within the binary norm. So my question is, well, can we create categories without this violence proce violent process of othering? Um, kind of um, going ahead on this idea of calculation of bodies, so this is, a, um, this is a really new research trajectory for me. Um, it's actually one of the, the first times I'm even presenting this, this work in progress. But um, I'm thinking a lot about the idea of human technological progress 
um, I'm thinking about how we take these fantasies of optimization and fitness and acceleration and apply that to the non-human. Um, so for example, um, I started, so this is an installation that um, it just opened actually earlier this month. Um, so the title of this installation is SCOBY Spin Cycle. So um, I came across this um, industrial bioreactor for growing SCOBY. And the SCOBY actually grows at 300 times faster rate than static fermentation. I found this to be really interesting because it's taking this, um, this multicultural, multi-species um, a symbiotic culture and, and industrializing it. And um, I'm gonna play this video. Sorry for the sound. I actually didn't want to have sound in this video. But um, when I saw images of this bioreactor, it really reminded me of human flesh. And so I, I wanted to make a installation where it's humans pedaling on an exercise bike and training their bodies while the non-human, the SCOBY are also training, right? So it's this idea of like the human and the non-human training together in this kind of fitness performance. So, um, so I, cause I also see how, you know, humans are also um, in this industrialized body because we've been measured and calculated and every part of our body has been territorialized by these calculations. And we apply that same logic to the non-human. Um, and I feel like these industrialized processes could really use more of this kind of feminist care and empathy in their design. And so I thought like, if we're able to train together in this cross species performance, then that will kind of reinsert the care and intimacy that is um, really lacking from these industrialized processes. Um, I, I titled, I put this title in the beginning, um, Faster, Higher, Stronger. So that's the, that's the overarching project that I'm working on. The SCOBY spin cycle is just one iteration of this project. Um, faster, higher, stronger is actually the official Olympic model. Um, so the Olympic games, like actually the official model is, is faster, higher, stronger together. Um, I find this really interesting because I kind of view the Olympics as the pinnacle of this kind of gender performativity because you have these incredibly athletic bodies performing at these incredible levels, but they only exist in two categories, male and female. So um, I have this idea to um, work with another non-human organism, which is uh, these transgenic yeast that can actually produce lactic acid. So the yeast are actually um, acting as human muscles because human muscles also produce lactic acid when, when we're exercising. So um, I want to create another kind of cross species performance, but I want to involve like professional athletes who really um, produce a lot of sweat and I want to collect their sweat and extract the lactic acid and um, with the yeast that are producing lactic acid at the same time, I actually want to produce a piece of biodegradable plastic to kind of point to the plasticity of our bodies and the plasticity of gender and how this is in constant uh, shape shifting with, with the environment. So this is a longer research project, but um, I'm really excited to make um, this piece of plastic that um, would be in response to, to these gendered categories um, in the Olympic sports. So I'm gonna end there and I'm super happy to take questions now. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. Everybody joined me in, in thanking Mary. That was that was just an incredibly rich talk and so much there that I am, you know, 
really delighted to have had you here with us today. Um, one of the things I think that strikes me, you know, immediately and overall about the work is this way that you're trying to um, get us to uh, sort of approach our current situation, not in this fix it mentality, but in a way to be adaptive, in a way to really look at, you know, what's around us and how we can embrace it rather than kind of fight against it or have this panic, as you said, this kind of, you know, gender panic that's going on that is really palpable, you know, men growing breasts and, you know, fish turning different sexes, which some of them do already. And it's just, it's like an amazing thing to witness. And, and I, I don't think as a culture, speaking of, uh, you know, specifically from the US anyway, that we have the tools to deal with this at this point. And this is one of the things that it, your work does so palpably and so, um, with so much humor and and it's really deep investigation. So thank you for it all. And and um, I guess I would just want to ask, like, how did you begin to get into all of this work in the very beginning? Because it's it's been such a great ride, you know, to watch how this has kind of changed over time for all of us <laughs> on the outside. Yeah, so I think Kathy, the way that we met um, was through the Art Science Center. And before Art Science Center, um, I was actually doing this documentary series on bio art and biohacking. So, um, so that project was between 2013 to 2015. And those two years really were like my, my biggest like research moment because I was gathering like all of these interviews and from and learning about the motivations of all these bio artists and biohackers. And it kind of allowed me to pick and choose um, which motivations I aligned most with. And of course, like I really was gravitating towards critical art ensemble, Sub Rosa, and all of these tactical um, biomedia people. And um, from there, um, I, I just viewed biohacking as inherently political. and. Of course, not every biohacker does it for political purposes, but I saw it as um, an incredibly um, uh, democratizing practice. So um, that's really uh, how I um, how this all started, I guess, and that's that's very much alive um, with open source estrogen and all of these strategies, um, all of these performative strategies in particular. Um, it's really coming from um, the pioneers like Critical Art Ensemble and Sabrosa. Cool. Yeah, that series is, is the Dissect series, right? And um, maybe we can put that in the chat so people can check that out because it's an amazing series of, of um, documentation. And so thank you for doing that. I, I do want to open it up to all of you because we've got a really wonderful um, group gathering of people here. And if any of you have questions, please, either raise your hand or, you know, shout it out um, or put it in the chat. One of the, one of those uh, would be really great. Um, so this recent work is also incredibly interesting in the, in the ways that you're working then towards developing the biodegradable plastic. And, you know, there's been a lot of hope in that uh, development. And I think, you know, some frustration too, because it's not taking off fast enough. Um, do you, how do you see this project as sort of like pushing the, the boundaries of that, that research, those hopes, et cetera? Yeah, so on the scientific research side, um, it, it is super promising. Um, because I've, I've been talking to some scientists who are working with these transgenic yeast and um, to create lactic acid. And um, they are designing these yeasts to, to um, operate at huge industrial levels. So um, they're trying to basically um, move these yeast into um, to the uh, industry sector. Um, but uh, I guess on a more artistic and social level, I feel like the project is more, um, I'm more trying to create this narrative between bodies having this um, plastic quality um, because um, plastic 
it kind of has this fantasy attached to it, you know, that we that it can just like shape shift into any kind of um, material. It can um, it can barricade us from the outside world. There's this idea of sterility and purity that's imbued in plastic. And um, the way that we design plastic really reflects these fantasies. And so um, I actually have this idea of working with um, like male athletes, you know, because um, right now there's this challenge going on. Um, it's kind of a, a social media challenge um, that got started by this famous UFC fighter. And, and he's telling all, the, all these um, muscle guys to, to show off their, their sweat soaked t-shirts after a workout. And they're just squeezing all this sweat out of their, their t-shirts and, and spreading that on social media because it's like a challenge. And I, and I thought, wow, that would be a, a, a great way um, to use that as the, the primary methodology of sweat collection in this, in this project to kind of tie in that, um, that toxic masculinity culture of like, oh, I'm so ripped. Oh, I, I just had a huge workout, you know, look at all this sweat, you know, and um, I would really love to include that audience um, into like a feminist project. Um, so yeah, so I'm trying to, to redefine um, um, these, the, the narrative that the Olympics already um, is presenting at a global stage, you know, um, when you go on the website of the Olympics, um, they have this whole, like, a uh, whole page about gender equality. But if you look closely, nowhere does it even mention intersex people, or even uh, the, the scandal that happened four years ago, where they disqualified intersex athletes who were who are competing in the female category because they had higher than normal testosterone levels. So this kind of policing of, of binary bodies um, is a narrative that is very, very, you know, we're completely colonized by it. And I really want to just rewrite this narrative and say that, well, actually um, bodies are not only uh, in two categories, um, we are very much um, as malleable as the, the plastic that is um, all pervasive um, on the planet. So um, that's kind of what the, the project is about. And it's like very much in the early stages. Thank you. Um, uh, is there anybody, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Is there anybody who wants to jump in? Cause we have this um, opportunity to ask Mary questions. Oh, um, I didn't explain uh, what SCOBY is. Um, so yeah, sorry about that. So the, the SCOBY is actually, uh, it stands for, it's an acronym for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. And so this symbiotic culture is actually what's responsible for the fermentation process in kombucha. And the SCOBY itself, it actually um, grows as this, as these layers of microcellulose. And, you know, in recent years, um, lots of industries have been trying to capitalize on this microcellulose. So for example, it's, they're using it for, for medical, um, um, medical um, materials, they're using it for cosmetics. So there's all of this um, profit that is to be gained from um, industrializing SCOBY. So um, yeah, so that's, um, that's my quick definition of SCOBY. It was really flushy. That was quite amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looks like flesh. Yeah, it's, it's kind of creepy to look at too. Totally. Um, I see some, some, is that, are those hands up for, there's a tar, Tara Matic is here in the house, Tara. Would you like to Hi. ask a question? I mean, I um, mostly I, Welcome. I, I wanna thank you for doing this. Um, I love your work. It, it is so dense that I'm having a hard time coming up with one question. I feel like after each section, I wanted to have a studio visit. Um, I think there's a lot of, 
I'm, I'm loving this. Um, and I, I should say I am a graduate of RPI from the MFA program. And there's some, um, there's some lovely crossover of what you're doing and what, what, what I, it, with my works. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, and I don't want to talk about my work, but I just want to say to you, oh, it's really fun and such a relief to be able to uh, meet and see other people doing work in this realm. And in this realm, I mean um, outside institutions. And I do have a question with that relates to that, but like creating new models um, and models that may or may not fail and working collectively with a focus on um, queer and gender representation. So I love it. A um, couple questions, I guess. These are good. Do you always, what kind of institutions do you work within and do you work outside institutions to gather your, what do they call us? Uh, what do they call you in science when it's your um, group study of people? Your control group. So when you get your, like, do you ever work outside of an arts organization or like community based organizations and, um, to gather your control group. And like, I'm curious about what that back and forth is about. Um, seems like you leave a lot up to mystery for them. But um, so the other question would be, as you're talking about the newest project where people are wringing out sweat, um, do you have concerns about your safety in that particular uh, project um, in terms yeah, in terms of the people that might be offering up their sweat samples. So two questions. One is like, yeah, that was amazing. Thank you. I'm so glad you're out there. Um, and thank you to Kathy and to, for, for organizing this. And then the other two are like, oh, uh, you're talking a lot about queering institutions and working against institutions and the structures of hierarchy. So um, I'd love an anecdote, an unexpected anecdote with a community-based organization or something where I can really sink my teeth into. Um, and then I just wanna watch the video again so I can um, ask you very specific, watch the whole lecture over again. Um, it's been a minute that I've taken notes so frantically during, I, so thank you again. And, <laughs> I'll, I'll mute myself. Thank you so much for your, your questions and your comments. And I would love to know more about your work actually, because um, you mentioned that there's so much overlap. Um, I guess to answer the, the first question about, um, about the focus groups or the institutions. So, um, so, I, it's really unfortunate for me to say, but um, I primarily work through art institutions. And I wish this wasn't the case because um, that means my audience is primarily from the art world or even the academic world. Um, I do work through academic institutions as well. So it's a very privileged audience and a very privileged space. Um, and of course, like, um, these are also audiences that are um, already knowing the discourse of, you know, um, queerness, queer identity, and all of these identity politics. Um, when I was in Indonesia, I think that was my, my main experience stepping outside of these privileged spaces um, and, and trying to um, absorb other knowledges that are outside my own knowledges. Um, that's why I'm, I'm really interested to work with um, an audience that's completely opposite of me. So like these um, really, you know, macho uh, bodybuilding guys, you know, um, with muscles popping, you know, like these types of people um, really like sporty athletic communities that, you know, really uh, love watching the Olympics, very nationalistic people, you know, like I think, um, I never encounter these people in my workshops and I probably never will unless I do a project that's involving them. So um, I'm thinking about, I'm really thinking about approaching um, uh, this type of group and collecting their sweats. Um, I don't know if there's any, 
really huge safety concerns with sweat. Um, obviously, it is a biomaterial. Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Oh, the concern isn't with sweat. No, nah, uh -huh. not with fluids. It's with the population that you'd be working with and their relationship or their non with if they're not familiar with queer discourse and mm -hmm. um, they're not friendly to our bodies because um, the gym and uh, is a very different location to get your control group and so for me and my concern wasn't about fluids it was about your mm -hmm. safety and how you would navigate that uh how would you entice them what would it you know and then how would you keep yourself yeah just how would you keep yourself safe if you're working with that group of people who i, I don't mm -hmm. trust uh, especially with the national yeah with everything you said i'm like ah i'm I would be afraid <laughs> for you for me <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, but I think that's also part of the, the process of, of culture hacking. Because um, I've been in space, I've been in a lot of male dominated spaces, namely at MIT Media Lab, very male dominated. Um, and there it was more about like, you know, boys and their toys and their technology. And in this space, it would just be, you know, men and their muscles, you know, and um, and I, I think I, I know um, the right strategy to, I also, um, I have a background in doing competitive sports uh, in high school. I was actually a wrestler. So I wrestled um, on an all boys team as the only non-male. And Me I've, too. yeah, and Dude, you also? Me too, yeah. Oh, no, wow. Now that you said that you're a competitive athlete and that you have, not in high school, but I was, the, so and now I'm like, okay, well, you've, you've experienced this. That changes everything. But my mind is blowing every time you talk about <laughs> how we've never crossed paths before. So, yeah. but now this really, that really shifts it. If you're familiar with, because I can see what you did. It, now it makes you shifts everything. But it's mm -hmm, still mm -hmm. scary, but it's just a lot for, for me to understand that you've been in those spaces. Okay, mm -hmm, muting. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah, I wanna talk about the, oh, I really, sorry, Kathy, I don't wanna dominate this. Really? My enthusiasm is so sincere and, and that hasn't been, I haven't had access to this in a minute. So I'll, I will now mute and take myself off screen to allow others. <laughs> thank you, you thank really? you so much. You really do have a huge amount in, in common. And um, Tara's work is incredible and has been, you know, dealing with things around athletics also and all kinds mm -hmm. of issues that are very similar to what you're talking about. And so um, I really think you would both have an awful lot to talk about. Um, Tara's an amazing and incredible performer and artist. Um, yeah, yeah Tara, it is let's kind get in of contact. I think I'll, I'll put you both in contact. I promise. Yeah, I promise, 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 promise. Yes, yes. absolutely. Um, I yeah, you're both included in my syllabus for my queer ecologies class. You know, I'm like, wait, how could you not know each other? Everybody knows each other. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, I think we also have a, a question here from Branda Miller, who had written me in the chat. So Branda, you want to unmute and jump into the mix here? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, very inspiring conversation and for all the work you do. And um, it's, it's really exciting to see how you um, blend performative action, participatory action and science. And in a way, I mean, you, you, you are an artist, but you really are a radical educator, right? And so you are like pushing um, uh, people's dominant um, circle of certainty about gender and about ecology. And um, I'm just wondering how you navigate that. You started answering that actually in, in, in the last question, um, uh, but how you can break out of um, um, not only uh, you know, um, the art world, but out of mechanisms of censorship, which close you down. How do you as an artist um, navigate um, that? I mean, you're pushing it with body fluids, with, with you know, the very core of your work. So, how do you navigate that that territory um, to you know continue that struggle for radical education? 
that must mm -hmm. be part of your art form actually that you're thinking about all the time so i'm wondering if you could respond to that mm -hmm. thank you so much mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no thank you so much for those comments um i feel like um the art world at least here in europe um i don't get censored so much up until a certain point so when you get to a certain point of the institution, you know, when it gets to a higher level, like the Belvedere Palace here in Vienna, um, then they will reject my um, idea to perform a urine ritual. Um, so it's it's kind of like figuring out what is the socially sanctioned spaces or socially acceptable methods where you know you can frame it as like, oh, it's like queer and trendy and kind of like capitalize on that because. I think that is part of what culture hacking means. It's like you you are entering these spaces that are kind of closed off, but you are um, you're trying to find like a loophole into it. So um, figuring out like okay, well I'm going to just yeah I'm just going to say it. I'm going to capitalize on being a queer, uh, non-binary, and also a non-white person because these are underrepresented categories in the art world. So I'm gonna capitalize on that. I'm gonna do this queer performance with urine. And, and so it's, I think that's part of that hacking. And um, I'm not like um, um, uh, opposed to using that method to get into these um, higher cultural spaces. Um, because yeah, I mean, um, I want to infiltrate these spaces. Um, I want to um, change these institutional structures from within. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just only talking about art institutions, but also the sciences. Like I, I like to try to find my way into these scientific spaces as well. Like I'm trying to right now establish a relationship with the scientist here in Vienna who's doing this lactic acid production. So, um, yeah, I, tr I really believe as a strategy, we need to uh, we need to change from within rather than just like always coming from the outside and being this outside voice kind of like kind of rattling the structure. I think we have to go inside first and then change it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. That's really great. We have some we have some uh, questions in the chat, which if anybody wants to just jump in with their questions, TC. Sao, do you want to um, jump in with your question, or do you want me to ask it? Um, yeah, so I can directly Thanks. ask. So sure. I'm curious. Thank you. So I'm curious about like how gender factor into that research activity, creative activity at MIT Media Lab. So yeah, so it was uh, something about voice technology and um, more on that line of thinking. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, so when I joined the Media Lab in 2015, um, it was only 30% women and even smaller percentage of non-binary people or gender non-conforming people. So um, there was a very strong kind of, not just a male presence, but like this very um, patriarchal way of dealing with technologies, which is very much about like technology, almost as like a colonial tool, like kind of like this like method of saving the planet or improving human life or quality of life. You know, it's like this very like techno utopian, way of designing technologies where it's all about like like deploying and like disrupting like disruptive technologies like it's it's all about this and um whereas what what i felt was lacking was more of like a nuanced criticality to designing te these technologies and like also trying to figure out how these technologies would um would have a life of their own like in the in the real world you know, like what are the real world consequences? Um, and also the consequences of these narratives, right? Because if you are constantly saying like, oh, this is gonna save your life, this is gonna improve your life, then um, people, then you're not really leaving much room for the, the critique to come in. So, um, and then another really 
big kind of patriarchal factor was all of the funding. Like there's so much money going into that institution. Um, there was even military funding going into that institution. So um, my research group, we were the design fiction research group and we were the only group that wasn't really taking this very um, techno utopian um, patriarchal approach to, tech to technologies. Um, and as a result, the group no longer exists because we were not able to get any funding to continue our research group. Um, because what the, the stuff that we were doing was not inherently utilitarian. You know, there was no use value. Like there was no um, financial value to what we were producing in that research group. So we only lasted three years. So this is the kind of culture that is at uh, MIT Media Lab. And, um, and as a result, like, you know, these, um, it also has this kind of, um, it has a, a public stage, you know, which is, can be dangerous, you know, because um, a lot of people are listening to those narratives and they're, they're absorbing them, you know? So, um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. That was, that was actually really great to you talk about that, Mary. And thanks for the question. Um, we have another question from um, Natalie Dubois Calero, who's um, tuning in from Canada. And she says she, they, she has some problems with the health and safety rules in Canada working in uh, academic contexts. How do you work with human fluids? She said the rules are there are stricter than they are for the biology lab around this. Natalie, do you want to jump in with any any discussion about this? I don't know if Natalie can yeah. get on, but um, I haven't had um, like health and safety kind of concerns working with the urine. Um, yeah, no. Um, and I've, I've even done workshops, like the urine workshops in um, academic spaces. And we never had um, any problems with that. I had a couple of problems with the transgenic yeast biosensors. Um, just because that, you know, there are some rules and regulations around transgenics. Um, but yeah, I can understand, you know, because a human fluid is considered biosafety level two. Um, but recently I haven't come across any of those, um, those restrictions. But then again, like um, in art spaces, usually they're really, um, they don't know about those restrictions. Um, they're not versed in, or they're not trained in, in those restrictions. So they usually just let it slide. Um, yeah. Thanks, Natalie. We really can't, can't um, unmute. So that was great. I think you covered it. That's really good. And um, I know we're running over time a bit and uh, I really think this has been, you know, a fantastic discussion on top of your amazing talk, Mary. So if anybody has any last gasp, anything they wanna shout out, do it now or- um, Yeah, there's just talk. one more question from Jacob. Oh, thank you. I didn't see that. Um, do you have a concept of what all you'll be able to pull from the bodybuilder, power lifter, sweat? Which hormones and other molecules will you be working with? Thanks, Jacob. Yeah, so, um, so I'm interested to extract only the lactic acid from the sweat. Um, the lactic acid has to be really, really purified as I understand it. Um, in order to produce this piece of plastic. So um, I'm in the process of researching this purification process. Um, but um, yeah, but I'm, I'm definitely more interested in the collection process and like who will be my focus group 
So, um, yeah, but I guess, yeah, this, this project is actually not involving hormones, which is kind of a deviation from what I usually do, but it's a, it's a nice deviation. Appreciate that answer. So fundamentally social then. Social in terms of it's a it's a fundamentally social experiment and not a chemical experiment. So you're really looking at just, you know, how does this social group interact with what you're doing, not so much the actual chemistry. Is that the case? Appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's both. I mean, I think the chemistry is also important to um, on the scientific level to really produce what I intend to produce. Um, but you know, I, I always woke, I always work in this um, with this ha hacker ethos of you know open sourcing everything that I do. So um, I would really love to um, like out of this project actually create a um, feasible protocol that could be reproduced outside of a laboratory because that's just the way I like to work. I like to um, make everything accessible and um, easy to reproduce. So. Um, yeah, maybe we will all have some um, sweat lodge um, facility where we're, um, that's how we're going to make our future bioplastics. Everyone's just going to sit in the sauna and sweat it out and have it get extracted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's where the, the chemistry will come in. And it'll be mm -hmm. really amazing to see that bioplastic come to life. So thanks. And thanks for that question, Jacob. All right. I think we're gonna close off now. Um, I wanna thank everyone for coming and for uh, participating in this, particularly Mary. And this has been just an incredibly great um, discussion, as I said, but also I loved having everybody here. So, um, uh, you know, kudos to Mary and to all of you for being here with us. And this is the end of our bio art series for the spring, but we'll be having more bio art talks in the fall and um, plus guaranteed queer ones, I guarantee you. So welcome everybody and tune in and come back. Thanks again. Thanks everyone.